Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? We're good? Well, if you're able to, why don't we stand? It is that time again where we get to meet together as brothers and sisters, lovers of the Lord, and declare his worth. And it might be that time for you, as it often is for me, to tell myself to wake up. And uh, it's, a, it's a biblical principle where sometimes you're just not really sort of there, maybe emotionally. But the Lord is worthy. So you just tell yourself, hey, it's time to give the Lord what he deserves. Can I get an amen to that? It's time to give him what he deserves. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of every praise, of every shout, of every guitar strum and drama, everything. He's worthy of it all. So this morning, that's what we're going to try to do is just give him what he deserves. And it might not be perfect up here. In fact, if I'm playing, it's, but there's probably going to be some mess ups. Um, but, um, but we're going to worship him. He's going to get what he deserves this morning as long as uh, our hearts and minds are focused on him. So we just invite you. Uh, to join us. And Lord, we invite you into this place and into this space because you're worthy. We want to lift you high. We want to exalt you. We want you to get what you deserve. We want you to be magnified. So come and receive your praise. Come and receive what belongs to you, Lord. Mm. We're here for you. <laughs> we are here for you. Place to honor 
can break out in praise and let your shadow rise. Oh, break out in praise.
your prayer this morning. Break our hearts. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into your name in this place. We exalt you. King of kings 
calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my name worship stay right here you know I wasn't here with you last Sunday how many of you were here for our sacred assembly last Sunday I was in California my nephew he is going through his rite of passage as a teenager um, and he asked me to be his mentor his spiritual mentor so I've been discipling my 16 year old nephew uh, in the word and prayer but man I was really missing you all last week but as the Lord was doing a great work here, he was also doing a great work in my family. And I want you to know, family, that we don't have to wait for a sacred assembly twice a year to seek the Lord, to be with Jesus, to have this freedom that we are singing about this morning, amen? You don't have to wait for the next one. The Bible says that when we seek him with all of our heart, he will be found by you. So when we seek after him, and it's okay, you can clap, you can say hallelujah, you can put your hands up. If you need Jesus this morning, I'm gonna ask the team to play through the chorus just one or two more times. If you need a touch from the Lord this morning between you and Jesus, you don't need me right now. If you need Jesus, it's between you and Jesus right now. Let's engage in worship. You can raise your hands. You can grab a hand next to you and say, would you pray for me? But let's seek after the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. Let's sing it out, church. Let's sing it out together. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. 
pray with me? Jesus, you are our living hope. And I want to pray for those this morning who may have been struggling to even sing through that. Because sometimes, family, it's true. Sometimes it's hard to have hope in hard times. But I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will not fail you. And he will not fail me. So hold on and cling to our hope of all hope, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for comfort for those who may be grieving. I pray for peace for those who may have lost a loved one or for those who are just having one of those kind of mornings, God. I pray that your presence would surround them, go before them, go behind them and all around them this, this morning, God. I thank you for our church family and all the different stages of life that we are in. And I pray, God, that you would continue to fill this house with your presence and to fill every one of our hearts and our homes with more and more of you, Jesus. And we say yes and amen to all that you have for New Hope Hawaii Kai and for us in our families. And the people of God said, amen, amen. Would you turn and greet one another in the Lord? We're so happy you're here with us this morning, amen. All right. Well, hey, good morning, family. Welcome to New Hope Hawaii Kai. How many of you guys are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. Woo. Wow, you guys sound magnificent. You guys should hear yourselves. You guys sound amazing. Give yourselves a hand. Come on. Come on, give your guys selves a better hand than that. Oh, all right. Hey, well, hey, good morning, family. Um, uh, we just want to welcome you here to New Hope Hawaii Kai. Um, if you're new to the family, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we got a bunch of ways to get you connected here and uh, make you a part of our ohana. Sometimes we call it the New Hope Mafia. Once you get in, you never get out. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was a little joke, but... We be careful, watch out. Yeah, and then so um, we have our bulletins. Uh, if you guys open that up, there's a, a a number or and a card that we can actually sign up. We can fill up some information, see some of our needs. There's prayer requests, and uh, we can drop it in the offering bucket as it comes around. Um, if you guys uh, like to use your phones, you can use your phone in church, and you can text in church to 808-670-3377. You know, I'm I'm so proud of myself for memorizing that number. You know. Yeah, it was like when I was a little kid, I had to remember my friend's number, you know, my own house number. I still do that. All right. So anyway, please text that number and text the word aloha. And one of our aloha specialists will get in touch with you and um, help you to become a part of our ohana. Um, we have two announcements today. One is we want to highlight our youth ministry. Youth ministry! You know... Man, I look around this crowd, and there's so many young people in here. Whoa. Yeah, that's you. I'm talking to you, right? And then so um, we have this awesome, awesome youth ministry that happens every Thursday night. It's over at our, our church office. We got information in your bulletin. There's a QR code to go and zap that thing if you want. And um, we just want to really invite you to be a part of that because it's an amazing time of raising up the next generation for Jesus. Amen? Amen, yeah. And then the next thing in our, in our, in our announcements that I really want to highlight is, you know, um, we've been working really hard to get all of our life groups up on our website. And so right now, if you guys were to look at our website and sign up for a life group, boom, all of our life groups are there. Okay? And then you can just click on one of those things and get in touch with these life group leaders and uh, get connected. Because, um, man, that's, that's where it all happens. As good as it is on Sunday morning, man, during the week when we're eating awesome meals, yeah, right? Auntie Martha's house got awesome meals, right? When we're eating awesome meals, breaking bread, getting into the word and praying, that's where it all happens. So please, please, please go ahead and check out our life groups because, um, yeah, we want you there. It'll be awesome, all right? That's it for our announcements. Uh, would you guys help with me um, in praying for our tithes and offerings? Okay, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, so much, Lord, that we get to come together as a family and praise your name. Lord, in Psalm 196, you show us, right, that we're supposed to shout to you, Lord. And we're supposed to join with all of creation in worshiping you. And so, Lord, right now, as we give of these tithes and offerings, we give it with grateful hearts, with hearts of joy and, and worship. And so, Lord, right now, we, we just um, we say thank you and we say we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, church. Get ready for a battle, cause you know All right, Philippians 1, 6 says this, And I am certain that God who began the good work in you, somebody say good work. The God who began the good work in you will continue his work until it is finished, finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Family, he is not done with you. Amen? Come on, that's good news. Father, would you bless us today, giving us a picture of your son, a clearer picture of Jesus, and draw us nearer to your heart this morning. Amen. How did you get here? <laughs> I ask myself that a lot. I get lost frequently. How did I end up here? And so, yes, there's a practical question of how did you get up here? You got up at a certain time. You maybe had an alarm. Or if you're one of those people that has 17 alarms and doesn't listen to any of them, God bless you. You're here and we love you. That's my wife. And it's like the third one goes off and it's like, just why? why? Like, what, what's the point here? What are we doing here? <laughs> But then there's other questions like, how did I end up in this place in life? How did I end up where I am right now? How did I end up at New Hope Hawaii Kai? And, and a lot of, a, a mentor of mine who was a professor used to say it this way. He said, you know, direction flows through relationships. And usually you can connect where you are right now with different relationships that have been in your life. Opportunities that have come up, a friend that you went to school with, that you grew up with, things like that. But what's amazing is how the sovereignty or the control or the safety of God's plan in and through your life, it's like a thread woven through every hurt, every success, every pain point, everything working, every redemptive possibility in your life being woven through with precision because God knows everything about our life. So the school that you went to is no accident. The place you were born, no accident. The history that you have is no accident. And then through circumstances and through moments of success and pain, suddenly we find ourselves here. It'll blow your mind if you think about it too much. I think about my wife. How did I end up 16 years married to my incredible wife? Well, I had friends in junior high. We had moved in. I didn't know that Tara had moved in a mile down the road. Yeah. And her family, yeah. And, right? And so the, she's there, but we didn't really meet each other in junior high. I went to the same junior high. I went to high school. I was a senior. She was a freshman. Then we meet. Her friends are the younger siblings of all the friends that I have in high school. And, and now I'm, we are there at Selena's High. And I'm in some tapered... Levi's jeans, in a grass skirt, and some New Balance shoes. Because I was rocking that dad style before it was awesome. I was a pioneer. Still no one gives me credit. So I'm, I'm there with an Aloha shirt. I see Tara, freshman. I'm the see great, awesome. Is it like, okay, whatever. All of a sudden I graduate and, and, and I'm still working in youth ministry, doing things. And she's involved in her church and stuff. And I see her again. I'm like, there's something about this girl. But I didn't want to be like the college guy in ju junior college that was like combing the high schools. It's weird. <laughs> I wasn't going to be the high school, per the, the junior college perv. I wasn't going to do that. So I waited. I said, okay, Lord, whatever you do, it's going to be awesome. She graduates. We go out on a date. That was a critical moment. Applebee's? 
critical moment. Okay? Splitting an Asian chicken salad? Yeah, that's a stewardship flex. <laughs> Believe it. Budget. Every dollar has a name. <laughs> then we go from there. We're a year in. I'm in love with I'm like, I'm in love with you. But I don't want to admit it because that's scary. I hadn't had the, the, the examples. My, my, I lost my dad young. There was different examples that I had that weren't so great. Some were awesome, some not. I was scared, and I'm in love with her, but I, I don't want to admit it. I don't want to admit it because that's too vulnerable. It's too real. And I got things to do for Jesus. I was so, I was like, ah, right? Like, we would go to parties, and to make sure that I wasn't distracted, I would ditch my wife at a party. Isn't that weird? Well, at the time, yes. We weren't married at 18. And then I remember the Lord speaking to me saying, you got to open your heart up fully, Pat, because you'll never know. And then that started a process, and it was risky. And, and, and again, now I'm, I'm, I'm recounting these events to this moment here. The experiences of our past that bring us to moments where now we're in Maui getting married, saying vows, committing life to one another forever. I think for many of us, when we think of our past, if you were to navigate some of that stuff, it can hold us back. It can hold us back. It can be like a weight, like an anchor tied to something that we've been trying to let go of for so many years. We've made mistakes and we've hurt people and, and, and we've hurt ourselves and we've lied and we've cheated. And we feel like the past is like the reason why God isn't interested in us. Uh, you know, and, and it's not just an adult thing. Many of us as adults, right, we do. You can remember moments that you regret when you were in high school or junior high. Pain points. High schoolers, you can remember if you're a sophomore, the things your fresh happened your freshman year. If we're not careful, we'll let the rear view of our past dictate the future. But there's a reason if your life is a car and that windshield is so big, the past is there so you can get a reference point of what happened back there. But we got to focus on what God is doing in front of us. Yeah, get bold. Clap on it. <laughs> praise, praise Jesus. I think the answer is realizing that Jesus doesn't just set us free from our past, but he opens up our future. That's why we, we're, we got to be certain. That's why Paul says, I'm certain that whatever God started, he's faithful to finish. And it's going to finish on the day when Christ Jesus returns. He's not done. It's not just done when we get all of our hopes and dreams met in this very short life. His work is not done until unto eternity, which is why we have to have Christ's return in mind. The urgency that we have is not that Jesus wants to make us the most comfortable people on the planet, which is like the total opposite of faithful Christianity, by the way. But it's that he is a soon coming king returning. There is a future hope that we have. And we can live in a not yet reality of God's blessings and purpose and love and connection while waiting for an almost coming it's like a not it's like a right here but not yet so we look at books like nehemiah to give us insight to give us insight about when god is giving us maybe new assignment new direction a project that's happening something is shifting and Nehemiah is about to embark on this project. Now, spoiler alert, in about four or five chapters, he builds a wall. I mean, I guess we could just end it there. All right, see you later. I'll see you at Heavenly Cafe. Right, like, it would be that simple, but there's something about the work of this wall that Nehemiah is about to embark on that is connecting past, present, and future. It's connecting past promise that God had for his people and even though the temple has already been built but still the work is not done and now the people are still yet unprotected the walls almost representing the the, the structure and the protection of the heart of the people of God that were returning to their land and here we find Nehemiah and he's crying that's why we're calling our, our series The Good Work, and we are going to actually spend quite a bit of time in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is going to take us on a journey together about what it looks like to see God rebuild the heart of his people, 
what it looks like to trust. We're going to gain insights about leadership. We're going to gain insights about a lot of different things. But hopefully, more than just more leadership insights, what we gain is a fresh perspective on the loving, beautiful, beating heart of Jesus for you and I not to remain distracted and disabled by our past but redeemed and empowered to exist in a present moment while we move towards a glorious future in Jesus. I mean, that's fantastic news. That's fantastic news. So let's look at this book. Because if you were to read the book, it would say the son of ne the Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah during the Hakaliah. Whoo! Read it. you got to say it like that too with the during the month of Chislev in the 20th year, when I was at the fortress city of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned him about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. So here's the story. Nehemiah is just doing his job one day. He's a cupbearer to a king, and his brother comes up, and he's like, man, how's it going? Like, I've heard about the people returning. And what are they returning from? They're returning from a very long exile that they were in. In fact, if you look at the verses in Jeremiah, I know we love this one. Jeremiah 29, 11. You could probably quote this one by heart. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. This is the Lord's declaration. For your well-being, not for disaster, to give a future and a hope. This is God's promise. His promise for his people. But we jump to that promise sometimes without recognizing the context of the verse right before when he says this. But you will be in Babylon for 70 years. Then I will come and do for you all the good things, the good things that I have promised. And I will bring you home again. Now why were they there? The people had forgotten God's heart. They were living any which way they wanted. Their hearts were wayward. I know we look at the past and we think, man, we are so smart, so advanced, so educated. But the truth is humanity's heart has been wayward since the beginning. And God's people had forgotten the God of their people, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They forgot their history. They looked at their past and they wanted to create a whole other future that didn't have anything to do with God and only with what they had control over. I feel, like, I feel like it's similar to our culture in this moment, almost. And so God corrects them. He says, now you're going to Babylon. Jeremiah's talking about it. People are frustrated, but 70 years go by. And now things are starting to get fulfilled. If you read in the book of Ezra, now Zerubbabel takes a whole group of people back to the land. And Ezra the scribe brings people there too. They build the temple there's things that are happening. The very fulfillment of words in Isaiah are being fulfilled. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the authenticity of Scripture, the beauty and the confidence that we can have in Scripture, and how even in Isaiah, when he would say things like in Isaiah 45, Cyrus, 150 years before this man ever existed, was ever a thought in his parents' mind, the Bible calls him out prophetically by name, fulfilling this word through the words and through the story of God's people in Ezra and Nehemiah. Now I know historical criticism might question this. They'd say, oh man, this is just some creative ancient Near Eastern author that really wanted to put the pieces together. And so they just filled it in to make the story fit. Except that when you go back hundreds and hundreds of years, hundreds of years when we discover things like the Dead Sea Scrolls that put these ancient texts and confirm one another, we can believe not only the historic accuracy of Scripture, but we can understand its supernatural prophetic capability. Not to be our daily fortune cookie, but to give us insight I would say prophetic insight and what I mean by that is prophetic heart of God connection to how we should live now because God will use our past to give clarity to our present and direction for our future and so this is where they find themselves 
So Nehemiah sees this. But then he says the remnant of the province who are survived in the exile, they're in great trouble and they're in disgrace. And Jerusalem's wall has been broken down. Its gates have been burned. And when I heard these words, Nehemiah sat down and he wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the Lord, the God of heavens. And I said, Lord, God of heavens, great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him. Here's what he's saying. God, God, I know you promise, you keep your promises, God. Don't get lost in the language so much. Like, connect to the heart. The language is here, but sometimes it's like I'm reading the Bible, so we're disconnected. He's saying, God. I've been crying for th three days, and you promised us something. So why is it happening? Have you been there? Have you cried out in a moment of confusion, frustration, and disappointment because what you believed you heard from God has yet to come to pass or not? Or what happened was not according to your plan, it was according to his. Nehemiah is experiencing this. It seems like he and his people just cannot escape the consequences of their past. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Here's what a smarter, older dude said about the past. You cannot change the past, but the past can change you. Either for better or for worse. It all depends on how you look at it. The past can be a rudder that guides you or an anchor that hinders you. Leave your past mistakes with God and look to the future by faith. Warren Wearsby. So how do I deal with my past? Because that's exactly what Nehemiah is doing. Now, again, you skip forward and you start seeing the, the work being done. But Nehemiah doesn't just start, you know, kicking tires and like just putting like Lego blocks together. He, what we're doing is we're setting up this, this history moment for us because there's so much value and importance in it to see why he reacts the way that he does. Why is he responding how he's responding? And how then does he go about dealing with his past and making decisions and not quitting when things get frustrating? And how can we do the same? Nehemiah starts by processing the past. He says this, listen to my prayer, look down, see me. He's saying, God, don't you see me? If you feel like your prayers are too honest for God to hear them, just look at Nehemiah. Because some of us might be praying some honest prayers lately. Some of us might be screaming into quiet pillows lately, just wondering if God is even listening. And Nehemiah is just saying this, see me praying day and night. I'm doing the work, God. Day and night for your people. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We've sinned terribly. How have they sinned? They sinned terribly by not obeying the commands and the decrees, not following the law, not keeping their hearts connected to God. The regulations, they gave up on them. You gave those to us through your servant Moses. So they are here because when God said, if you just trust me and follow my ways, I'm going to bless your socks off. Trust me on that. But if you, if you step outside of my safety, I'm going to allow you to experience the desires of your heart. I'm going to allow you to experience. I, I think sometimes God in his sovereignty, because he is always pursuing us, there are moments we'll, where God will give us what we want. And he will give us what we want so that when we taste it and see that it is not what we thought it was going to be, maybe because we have tasted and seen that God is good, we will come running back to the bread of life, to the water of life, to the light of the world, amen? When we try and taste darkness, and then we say, I don't want to be here. This is ash in my mouth. I don't like it. I want that sweet, sweet honey that is the word of God, that is his presence. We're going to come running back. So God's people went off. God loved them so much that not only did he allow them consequence, he actually allowed circumstance to correct hearts back to him. Because God is a loving father, and a father disciplines the children that he loves. 
And so that is what we see, the heavenly father, heart of God, loving, correcting, disciplining a people towards. But before they move forward, they have to look in that rear view and say, where did we go off? Where did we get lost? Nehemiah says it this way, we sin. We sin and we distanced ourselves and we, we stopped following you, God. And, and he says, I'm sorry. He's not scared. He is so moved and broken that he's, he's not scared of, of that, that history, that very real history of his family and his generation before him, that there was brokenness and rebellion and sin. And he's just like, that's what it is. It's there. It's in all of us. We did it. God, could, could you make, it, make a better way for us? We can't be afraid of what happened in our past. Cannot be afraid of it. I want to encourage you, don't be scared of what has happened in your past as if it is what disqualifies you. Nobody's qualified. Amen? Some of us maybe feel like, oh, maybe, maybe it, it's taken a while to even step into the church service because i got to kind of clean myself up before I get there. We'll never be clean enough to approach. Jesus is who makes us holy. Amen? He did it. That's why we come as we are to the throne of grace. My counselor said it like this, that trauma is like a, any memory that's attached to a negative emotion. I never thought of it that way. And I wonder how many of us are experiencing those moments, those memories that are attached to such negativity. And we're like, but I moved on from it. But when something similar happens, it's like a button gets pushed and it's like, Goop! you feel it. All of a sudden, that anger point that you thought you had put to sleep is awake and alive. All of a sudden, that pain point, that regret point, that insecurity moment pops up. And that's why it's imperative that we process with Jesus and trusted friends, mentors, even counselors. Because if we don't let Jesus transform our pain, we often will transmit it to someone else. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. We cover it with more discipline. We cover it with a better morning routine. We'll cover it with better friends, more money. We'll do something to try and cover it, but here's the thing about the human heart. It's consistent. And it needs a renewal in Christ Jesus. Because if we do not deal with those moments, they come up, and now you are screaming in your house about dishes. And it doesn't make sense. I'm telling you, that the, I don't know why those are the things that God uses to just bring it all up. Who loaded this dishwasher? Who did it? I know I've done tutorials. But now we're talking about that when my wife and I really need to be talking about a moment that happened two years ago. And we've been scared to touch that conversation. There are things in our past that we're scared to touch. And I am not telling you to go run and have all kinds of irresponsible conversations and just, you know, just start stirring the pot. Let's just open up the can of worms today. What's under the rug that we've been sweeping for 20 years? What I'm saying is pray and ask the Holy Spirit for the discernment to lead you in how you might deal with a pain point. That you are wrestling with today. Because there is freedom in Jesus. And aren't you glad he doesn't deal with all of it all at once? I think I might die. <laughs> There's too many things. There's too many things. Whatever you feel like is holding you back. Jesus already knows about it fam. He died for it. He wants to show he can redeem it. Family. When when pornography was still gripping my heart in the first years of my marriage. Shame, disgust with myself, anger, frustration, all of the things that anyone would feel. But I'm telling you, Jesus was never intimidated by that brokenness. And I had to look at my past to understand my present struggle so that with Jesus I could make a different choice for my future. And I needed people that I trusted. And I needed my friends, and I needed my pastors, and I needed my incredible wife and her grace towards me. 
Maybe it wasn't that for you. Maybe it was something else. Maybe it has nothing to do with that. I don't know. But we must process our past if we are to move forward with a degree of freedom and abundance in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so after we process that pain, we may have to own some stuff. Nehemiah took ownership. Listen to my prayer. He says, we sinned. I confess that we have sinned terribly. He doesn't even say we kind of did a little. He says, we are terrible. I love the language of scripture. We get to let the text just speak. We've sinned terribly by not obeying. In fact, even my own family and I have sinned. Really? Your, your family sinned? Weren't you in exile? Was it your family? What is it, 70 years? How many years does it, does it before a new generation? Is it something like 20 years? Something like that, right? They, they, a new generation just about every 20 years. So if, if we're talking 70 years, potentially three generations have passed since God started correcting people for things that their grandma and their great-grandma and their great-great-grandpa did. So was it Nehemiah? Well, not him personally. But see, in the Bible, there was a very clear understanding of a corporate identity of God's people. It wasn't just individual. We think individual. I have a personal savior. I say a personal prayer. I have a personal devotional time. Me, 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 me. But for the people in the Bible, everything was connected relationally. You, you were not defined apart from the community and the family that you were in. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we are who we are. And so Nehemiah is taking on a sense of corporate repentance, and he is saying, I am taking personal responsibility, yes, for things that I didn't do personally, but I am praying them out because they need to be brought up so that we as a people can be set free. See, Jesus might be in our heart, but I, somebody I, I read often, his name is Peter Scazzaro, he says, but grandpa still might be in your bones. And that's why we need that process of sanctification or growing in looking like Jesus every day. So we got to process our past and then we have to own it. We have to take ownership. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of our family history. Own that family history. You got nuts family? Join the club. Some of us are just better at hiding it. It's crazy. Like when you think, like somebody, I was telling us like, I, I, I was telling them some experience that I had as a family, as a kid, and I just never really thought like my, I know that I've experienced some degree of hardship, but I was like, yeah, this happened. Oh, I remember this happened, and then that happened. And, and then someone was like, dude, that's insane. I was like, what are you talking about? You're telling me, and then he, he just retold me what I had just told him, and I just think I was living in my crazy for so long, right? We're just living in our story. We don't even, even know that there was, oh, yeah, that, I guess that was worse than just it was a bad Tuesday, you know? Sometimes we need an outside perspective because then I'm realizing how can I own things so that I can move forward? See, we've just been reading in the book of Acts, and what did the book of Acts say when, I think it was Stephen that was giving this address to the people, or maybe it was Peter yeah, I went to Bible college. It was one of the two. <laughs> and he says, repent so that judgment and comparison may come. No, he doesn't say that. He says, repent so that times of refreshing can come. Yeah. Ooh, did you hear that? From the back to the front. <laughs> we get so scared of repentance. I think we get so scared of owning because then we're exposed. And we're exposed. And I get it. I get it. I'm living it too. You and I are in real time living this reality. That's why I don't understand people sometimes. And maybe, I, maybe it's a, it, it's, we're defining this differently. Sometimes I don't understand people when they say, I don't have any regrets. I'm like, really? How does that feel? <laughs> How did you work that one out in your everyday life? That's crazy. So all your plans worked out. Whoa. I, I mean, okay, that was a little sarcastic. I'm sorry. 
I just don't, I don't get that. Now, I, I guess maybe I understand because what I hear usually after that is I have no regrets because if those things didn't happen, and I don't make those, if I didn't make those mistakes, then I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Absolutely, it's true. God uses our past to give clarity to our present, to give direction to our future. I agree. Awesome. But you don't regret saying that thing that you said? You don't regret cheating the way that you did? I don't regret speaking mean-spiritedly and specifically in order to get an, an, a reaction out of my wife because we were in a fight that she was winning and I didn't like the balance of power. And so I said something just so I knew it would throw her off and now the power balance has shifted. I, you don't, I don't regret that. Oh, no, no, I, I regret it. Because those things bring more pain than we even know. So I'm not saying we have to be held. That's why the rearview mirror is small. It's small. It's not as big as the windshield of our life. We need to look forward. Paul said it. I press on towards the goal. He's like, I was the worst, guys. I'm the worst sinner. I did the worst stuff. Uh, it's terrible. Jesus redeemed me, so I let go of what is behind, and I press on to the prize of my calling in Christ Jesus. Amen? So I'm not telling you, now we all have to have like past sessions where we just need to linger and live forever in the mistakes of our past. That is not regret. I'm talking about genuine repentance. Repentance when the only redemptive value that a pain point or a success point has is when we are able to give it to Jesus to do something with. Otherwise, it just becomes fuel in my agenda. So yeah, I regret. I regret <laughs> causing hurt. I regret spreading that gossip. I repent of sitting in shame longer than I needed to. I regret of believing lies about myself that I was speaking over myself because I didn't know what else to say. I was so frustrated. And God was saying, I don't even say that over you. What are you doing? And I'm like, no, today, God, I don't listen to you. I listen to my angry thoughts about me. I have to own those things. So here's some questions. Because I think walking the road of repentance is the only way out of regret. It's the only way. Because otherwise it's like, no, that's just who I am. And we don't have the re reflective capability to own something that God can then bring such a redemptive power to. Isn't that what Jesus does? Come on, man. This is, he's so faithful. So re re what regrets do I carry? Have I given them to Jesus? Do I need to take ownership of something personally or corporately? What action step do I need to take right now? After we take that, here's the thing, family, is that I think there, there is, there's a fear because I think when we actually come face to face in terms of who we are, okay, I'm going to go from, from individual to even us as a church, right? Like, when I come to, vo to being just vulnerable about who I actually am in front of all of God and his holiness, I can't hide. And that's so scary. But the beauty of the gospel is this. He says, come to the throne of grace with boldness. Don't be scared because I'm not scary. I'm holy. And the only reason why you don't have to be scared is because Jesus is the pathway. If Jesus is out of the way, all we get is wrath. But now that Jesus is the lens by which the Father sees us, it's, it's his love. And it's his truth, and it's his beauty, and it's his connection, and it's, it's, it's good. It's so good. <laughs> so there's that. And then we, we think this way. Okay, even as a church, prophetically, where we are in this moment of time, in this culture, nationally. And I'm not the best culture like evaluator. I'm just saying, as a gathered people of Jesus, in our efforts to try and uh, engage with God's mission, what are things in our past that we need to let go of? Because God is leading us into a different future. What are ways that, methodologies that we have held on to a little too long because they were too familiar that we need to let go of because while they were good in one season, in this season, it's not that they're bad. It's just that God is asking us to do something else. You know, as we get, like, you think about this in your own life. Jesus is leading our church. 
And as leaders, we have to take a very sober look at the way in which we are discerning that corporately so that when we're, when we're trying to do things that are faithful, I wonder, do we have to own things? And, and I think about this often. Do we have to own ways that we have done things that actually were not the best thing? That didn't serve our community well? I mean, that's real. And it's okay. Because this is when we get to walk into a beautiful spirit of repentance, even as leaders, even as a business owner, even as a teacher, someone who leads something. When we walk in the beauty of, of freedom in Christ, the road to repentance, all that comes is refreshment. It's beautiful. All that comes is okay now, but we can only walk it if we're humble. We can only walk that road if we're humble. You know, many of us maybe have church hurt. Many of us have experienced those kinds of things, and that language is really prevalent in our culture right now. The church hurt, and, the tri and, and absolutely, there are legitimate pain points, but we cannot move forward, any of us, unless we move forward with full transparency, total humility, and surrender. Because, family, the truth is, none of us have it all figured out. None of us have it figured out. And that is not an excuse for further pain points. It's, a, it's an urgency to go lower and to be in the presence of Jesus so that we have his heart. Amen? Come on, this is as true for us as a church. It's as true for you as a business. It's as true for you in your marriage, for your siblings, in your high school. It's true. And after we process that past and after we take ownership, we just say, we own it. We own it, guys. Three is we trust God's process and it leads us to his promise. Amen? Remember what you told your servant, Moses. No, this is, I love, I like Nehemiah and I love the, 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 the beauty of scripture, how they write it, because obviously it's like, hey God, I want you to remember what you told. Really, you're going to remind God? Yeah, that's what he does. He wrote, you remember, you said it, maybe it's more for me than you, but you said it. You told Moses, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But, someone say but. That's a big old but. If you return to me and you obey my commands and live by them, here's the process. If you return and obey and live by them then even if you are scattered to exiles to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. See, God's love is affection. God's love is kindness. But God's love is correction. It's encouragement. It is rebuke. All are part of a process. And our action step is to simply trust the process that you may be in right now. See, even Zerubbabel, he needed it too. Before Nehemiah came Ezra. Before Ezra, there was Zerubbabel. He was the first guy. And he's like, okay, I, I'm on this mission now. I'm bringing God's people back. And this is what a prophet told him. Sometimes we think that prophecy is fortune telling and future telling. I think biblical prophecy, there's an element to that. But I think it has way more to do with connecting people with the message of God's heart. What is the word that God is speaking that connects his heart to his people? The prophetic word that draws people who have gone wayward back to. Because the world has plenty of critics. The world has plenty of people that can posit and futurists that can say these different things. The prophets, you and I, the people with the prophetic heart of God, we might be able to evaluate and even criticize the culture, but we have to do it from the framework of God's heart to bring people right back into center, the center of God's heart for his people. It has to be this way. Otherwise, we're just critics, and I'm tired of that. So, that was a good clap. I think that was Pastor Jay. We're getting bolder and bolder today. So he answered, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by strength nor by might, but by my spirit. So he says, Zerubbabel, you're going to do this, but it's not going to be because of your strength or your might. The process is going to happen, but it's not because you're more disciplined. It's because of me. you got to trust me. And then he says this, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Since the seven eyes of the Lord, the perfect vision 
That's with seven eyes, a perfect vision of the Lord that ranged to throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. What is he saying? Don't despise the small moments of obedience to do what I'm asking you to do. In fact, the perfect God with perfect vision, perfect love, and perfect justice rejoices when you take a simple step of obedience. That is nuts if you didn't hear what I just said. The, the God of the universe cares that you listen to him on a Tuesday afternoon. That instead of reacting the way that you normally did, you took a second to pause. And you said, okay, Jesus, what do, you, what, what, what do I need to do in this moment? It's so powerful. See, in the story of my life, my past gave clarity to my present. I understood. And it helped me determine the next steps of my future. And that's why for me, and our worship team, you guys can come on up. I want you to know that um, I used that timer again <laughs> from last week. <laughs> it was about February 2019, so Tara and I, we've been married 16 years, and hey, man. <laughs> Which is another way of saying she has said yes to me every day for 16 years. <laughs> Praise Jesus. But I was having a real hard time in, um, in the first two years of my marriage because I was frustrated with Jesus. And so I was frustrated with me. And so although I would always say that Terry and I were a team, I, I would absolutely have to own the fact that that wasn't true what I really wanted to do was what God wanted me to do and and she could just be my awesome cheerleader on the side it was really more about me than it was about we and us together and look every marriage team is different so I, I'm just telling you our experience together and I remember being so frustrated because I wasn't getting what I thought I deserved I went to Bible college and I I prayed a lot and I read the scriptures and I did what I was supposed to do and I didn't do dumb things when I was in my 20s like a lot of my friends. You know, like all the religion, I was like the older brother in the prodigal son story. That was me. He's my favorite. <laughs> and so I remember, and then I was having a Nehemiah kind of honesty with Jesus because I was driving the car and I wasn't like, God, I just want to trust you. I was angry and I was shouting as loud as I could on I-5 in Tacoma, Washington, shouting, screaming, crying at Jesus. Angry. I was 27. And it was an audible voice, but it was almost like a thought in my head. And it was like when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And, and it was like, Pat, unless you learn how to do this with your wife, unless you learn how to do this shoulder to shoulder, you're, you're never going to do it, Pat. I'm not going to let you. I love you too much. And it broke me. It broke me because it confronted me with my own arrogance as a young man. It doesn't matter how right, how much right I've done. If I'm, I'm holding on to that kind of arrogance, if I'm holding on to that kind of pride, I don't want to do that. I don't want it in my game. I had four mentors in my life, four older men in my life that, that brought me up in Jesus and showed me the beating heart of God. <clears throat> but only one is not divorced. Only one. Only one does not have estrangement from his family. So this is very real for me. I repent to Tara, and, and, and it changes the whole trajectory. That, that, those years were, were amazing in Tacoma. They reset us, and they, they brought a foundation, and our team began to develop. And then I meet Aaron Cordero, and I come to Hawaii. And I, I, I step into these roles, and now I'm growing. I'm working different tool, the tools that I've learned, the skills in a whole different context. But how many of you know that sometimes you got to go back to some of those places? Because I found in 2019, in February, that Tara and I were not talking anymore. Like, we were talking, but we were not connecting. We were not actually, there was like the concept, we were missing each other. And we both use like so many words. <laughs> it's not that the talking isn't happening. It's always happening. <laughs> But whatever our hearts were trying to say was getting lost. And I didn't know what to do. So I called Carl and he came over and talked to our pastoral staff. And I was just honest. And I'm like, it's like we're talking, but I don't get it. And I feel like I'm hurting my best friend and I don't know why. And so we had to go. I had to go look in my rear view. What, what, God, are you, are you showing me something? And he, he highlighted a few things. And I worked with with some people, and I, I, I saw a counselor. We both saw a counselor. We still see a counselor because we think it's an actually really good thing. That was February 2019. COVID hits the next month. 
or the next year, a year later, heart, one of the hardest for me, there's just a lot of things, a lot of stuff for everybody. For me, it was rough. And all those things came up again, but now I have new skills and new tools, but I'm committed to a process because I am determined that I don't want to do this on my own. I'm determined that I don't want to do this in my own strength. And, and, and like, like Zechariah said to Zerubbabel, I don't want to do this in my own strength because I don't have it. And, and my strength usually comes off as dominance and anger and loudness because those are the tools that I was given when I was a kid. Hammer everything because everything's a nail. This is how you solve problems in my family. But what I saw was people that didn't feel safe enough to be honest, so I needed to be honest. And what I saw often were men who, while they blessed me, but they didn't slow down enough to deal with things in their past or their present, so they couldn't take ownership and walk in the refreshment of beautiful repentance. And what I knew, that I didn't want to just do better because I was disciplined. But better, me better, my effort wasn't going to cut it. It was by surrender. Some of you are trying real hard. Some of you are trying real hard. I don't even know what it is. You're trying real hard. And I'm telling you, God sees your effort. But I'm also telling you, there are some try, there's some try. We just need to surrender. And we just need to say, Jesus, what are you asking me to do? Instead of trying harder, I surrendered more. And I got more honest. And I'm going to tell you that I thought I was good at it. And you can talk to our staff. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm in process. There are moments where I'm doing better. And then there's moments that I just like pull away and I don't get it. Is it okay that your pastor's being a little bit honest today? Because while it is personal, it's also communal for us. We do not need to be shackled to traumas and pains and disappointments and brokenness of our past because the power of Jesus is bigger. He is better at saving than we are at sinning. He is bigger. His resurrection power is so much more. It's so much more. You think that it's because your family history is nuts. I'm telling you, he's laughing about it. He's like, just watch me do. I can make peanut butter out of nuts. It's, it's, it's so crazy what we can do if we, would just, if we would just let him. And I'm really trying to pull this in because I don't want to freak everybody out with me getting emotional, right? I just, I just want to invite us in. <laughs> he is so good. And if you're a junior high or a high schooler in this place, I want you to know that Jesus knows you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And the pathway to access it is in Jesus. If you're a young adult trying to get direction, process these moments now the best you can with people you trust. And if you're maybe in your 30s or your 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s, should I stop? Should I? Keep going. Uncle Bob says, 80s, 90s. I just want you to know that God is not done with you. But won't you stand? We're going to worship. We're going to sing that, uh, that last song maybe, yeah? Yeah, yeah. We're going to sing Living Hope. And as you do, I wonder, is there a husband in the house that's just believing that you are just like the worst husband ever? <laughs> Dad in the house is just feeling like, I keep trying, but I feel like it's, I'm just telling you, Jesus has a different opinion about you than you might have about yourself. There might be a wife in here that's struggling, a sister in here that's just feeling like she is not enough. And I want to tell you, none of us are. We're only enough because Jesus made us enough. Amen? It's him. It's him, but he sees such beauty in you. So I just want to pray for you. We're going to worship after service if you want to come up and respond in prayer if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life I would love to talk with you if you need prayer for healing we want to pray for you if you need to surrender something from your past then let's do it family let's not spend one more set of 24 hours holding on to chains that Jesus broke 2,000 years ago
It may not happen like this, but today is the day of salvation and freedom. And it's available for you. So if that's you, I just want you to worship and respond to the King because you don't need me. We need Jesus. Let's lift our hands and let's worship him. could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night yes, Jesus. then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living who could imagine so great a mercy what how could fathom such boundless grace the God Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. It's grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe
you to just pray this simple prayer with me. Jesus, I surrender my past. I surrender my present. And I'm trusting you with my future. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, family. Come on, God bless you, family. Hey, fam, if you need prayer today, if you need to take a step towards Jesus you've never taken, don't wait. Come right on up. We have a prayer team right here. If you need prayer for any reason, we'd love to pray with you. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Come on, Nehemiah. Let's go.